section. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, hopefully this works for everyone. Um, and switch on the laser pointer. Yeah, so thanks very much again for the introduction, for the invitation. Um, uh, and thanks everyone for, for coming in and, um, and uh, listening. Uh, I hope today to discuss with you the question of uh, what is the role of mountain uplift, for example, of these mountains in the background here on global climate. And I, and I don't mean climate um, for on sort of short time scales, um, like orographic precipitation or so on, but thinking about climate on geologic timescales. And uh, the talk today is not going to be a typical sedimentology talk, I guess. There's not going to be that many sediments per se that, that we're uh, looking at, but I think um, it has uh, a lot of implications for sedimentary archives and records that we can perhaps discuss at the end. So this question of how does mountain uplift impact climate comes back to uh, a sort of or links back to another question of how, has it, how is it possible that Earth's climate has been relatively stable over uh, millions, perhaps billions of years. So here's a temperature record through the Phanerozoic. And um, it shows that, that the temperature range across the last 500 million years has not exceeded plus or minus 10 degrees. So between 10 and 30 degrees uh, for most of the time. Maybe there are some excursions here, but somehow Earth climate or Earth temperatures have always returned back to the sort of average of 20 plus minus 10 degrees. And this has made the evolution of life possible on Earth, of course. Um, and, and that's not, I mean, we maybe take it for granted, but it's actually quite remarkable to think about how is it possible that this, these temperatures are so stable over these long time scales, especially if we think of, for example, our sister planet Venus, where this hasn't happened. Uh, and now surface temperatures on Venus are around 460 degrees. Um, so somehow uh, Earth must have mechanisms that keep the CO2 uh, concentrations in the atmosphere and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, of course, also uh, constant over, over uh, these sorts of timescales. Um, not constant, sorry, but like a relatively in a relatively narrow range uh, across this time scale. And so the idea is that Earth has some sort of thermostat, um, uh, which is depicted here. This is the, the, the model idea that essentially are mechanisms or a suite of mechanisms that manage to keep Earth climate relatively stable. And so to, uh, to delve into this, uh, let's first look at the sort of major components of Earth's carbon cycle over geologic timescales. Here are some of the key pieces. Um, and, and there are you know, three main cycles or components of, of this uh, carbon cycle that we can identify. First, CO2 gets degassed from the crust and mantle um, at volcanoes, for example, or um, in mountain ranges, active mountain ranges by, by the decarbonation of, of metamorphic, uh, the metamorphic decarbonation of, of carbonate rocks. Um, and then uh, there are, there is an inorganic and an organic carbon cycle. Uh, the organic carbon cycle consists in the erosion of biospheric organic carbon, so plant matter, for example, um, from the Earth's surface. And then some of that organic carbon can be buried over geologic timescales. Um, and then the sort of, uh, yeah, that would be a CO2 sink. And then there's a corresponding CO2 source where fossil rock organic carbon and rocks when it comes to the surface can reoxidize and therefore emit the carbon back to the atmosphere. And then there's an inorganic uh, sort of cycle, if you will, uh, where uh, silicate weathering uh, is, a, is a CO2 sink, draws down CO2 and fuels the precipitation of carbonates in the ocean that lock up the carbon over long time scales. Um, and then there are other weathering reactions that can act as a source of CO2 to the atmosphere. In particular, the combined weathering of sulfides and carbonates. So sulfides, for example, pyrites and rocks and carbonates that can act as a CO2 source to the atmosphere. And so here are our components. And so there are CO2 sinks and sources in this, in this carbon cycle. And the key thing in order to keep climate stable over a long time scale is that these have to uh, that the CO2 sources and CO2 sinks have to balance quite tightly over million year timescales in order to explain the, the narrow range of CO2 concentrations that we've had. And here's some, some model um, uh, 
that essentially says, well, what if I start with one some CO2 concentration, let's say the pre-industrial atmospheric CO2 concentration, and now I have a 25% excess in CO2 drawdown from the atmosphere. Um, and this model basically says that after less than a million years, we would enter CO2 concentrations that we haven't observed over the last 400 million years. And similarly, if we have a 25% excess in CO2 emissions, we would enter uh, CO2, uh, we would have more and more CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, and after about two or three million years, uh, we, we would hit uh, concentrations that we haven't observed. So this is to say that the emissions and drawdown have to be quite tightly balanced, um, at least over sort of geologic million year timescales. And so that, that, that means that we have probably, we need some sort of negative feedbacks or, or, or stabilizing feedbacks in the system. And one of the key feedbacks that has often been evoked and that probably most of you will have heard is, um, as we've already mentioned, the sort of silicate uh, weathering, which occurs when CO2 um, dissolves in water. So atmospheric CO2 dissolves in water. And then this water trickles through the subsurface, flows through the subsurface and dissolves fresh um, silicate minerals. Here's an example for plagioclase, calcium plagioclase, uh, but you can also take other minerals, uh, silicate minerals. Um, that then frees cations um, such as calcium and then produces bicarbonate. Um, and, and this can this bicarbonate and calcium can precipitate as calcium carbonate in streams, but also the ocean mainly, um, and basically lock up one of the carbons that was initially sourced from the atmosphere. And importantly, this weathering, these weathering reactions um, are climate sensitive. So the, they are or sensitive to, to parameters that are, that are controlled by climate. Um, they're sensitive to temperature because the dissolution of, of many uh, or many dissolution reactions are, are temperature sensitive. And they're also sensitive to the availability of acidic fluids moving through the subsurface and therefore could be um, sensitive to, to runoff or precipitation and, and, and um, the, how, how strong the, the water cycle is basically. And, and that then leads to, you know, you can make a very simple formulation here that weathering fluxes should be a function or should be somehow sensitive to um, the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere. And this then creates a negative feedback that can explain or that is one explanation for a thermostat. So just to drive this home, uh, this point home, um, if CO2 increases in the atmosphere by some mechanism that warms the planet, the water cycle becomes more vigorous and that would then uh, increase weathering fluxes according to this uh, reaction and silicate weathering flux, silicate weathering draws down CO2. So the CO2 would, would stabilize again. So essentially with our, with, with silicate weathering, we have a mechanism um, that, that could explain the stabilization of, of climate over millions of years. Okay, so this is a bit of a background. Um, what I want to ask today is what controls the temperature that this thermostat is set to. Essentially, what controls how efficient these weathering reactions are? Um, and uh, in other words, you know, you could think of it of, as what controls this parameter k in this in this in this equation. So, at what temperature do I do, do silicate weathering fluxes balance the degassing from the crust and mantle? And again, there's been a, an idea that's been around for a while, and that is that this. This, this, this effectivity uh, of, of, of silicate weathering, the efficiency of silicate weathering is controlled by the exposure of fresh material at Earth's surface. So you can think of a, of a landscape, uh, of a sort of soil mantled landscape like the one on the left here, uh, where we have maybe thick soils and, and reactants have a hard time to get to fresh minerals to dissolve these and weather them. Um, so here, weathering overall is maybe a little bit less efficient than uh, in the landscape to the, to the right, for example, where we have plenty of fresh material around. Um, so any reactive fluid can, can easily find materials um, to, to weather. And so the idea here is that in, in landscapes that are eroding relatively slowly, so where the surface of the earth is renewed relatively slowly, um, there's a lot of weathered minerals already at the surface of the earth. And therefore, the efficiency of, of new weathering is, is relatively low. And then the opposite is true for the landscape on the right. And so the idea could be that um, 
essentially in this Mickey Mouse uh, way of, of explaining things, um, the, the, the landscape on the left would need a warmer temperatures, more vigorous climate, more vigorous water cycle to, to achieve the same CO2 drawdown than the landscape on the left, uh, on the right, um, and therefore uh, essentially has a, would set the thermostat to a higher temperature, to a warmer temperature. And so this idea here relies on a link between erosion and chemical weathering. So physical erosion, the, 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 yeah, the lowering of the earth's surface and the, the rate at which fresh minerals are brought to the surface and the rate at which they are chemically uh, weathered, especially by silicate weathering. And if we look at global rivers, here's a compilation uh, of, of global um, rivers and the silicate weathering fluxes that, that we can measure from them. So if we go to a river, we get a water sample. And the idea is you get an integrated signal of all of the uh, material uh, that has weathered from the landscapes upstream. And if we uh, measure the or estimate the weathering fluxes um, and plot them against the, the physical erosion flux, or I guess the total erosion flux in this case, um, we get a positive correspondence. So you can think, oh, okay, sure. Uh, if we increase the erosion, if we uh, make the landscapes look more like these mountains here, then maybe weathering, silicate weathering is more efficient and therefore, um, and therefore uh, this would support our, our hypothesis that, that it would potentially cool climate. So the idea here is that if erosion goes up, weathering goes up, and then that draws down CO2 and cools climate, essentially turning down the thermostat cooling the earth, um, right? By supplying minerals, of course, erosion also sort of control or tectonics, I guess, control the, the types of minerals, the lithology and the mineralogy that is exposed. And this then leads to, to, to this hypothesis that's about, uh, I guess, almost 30 years uh, old now, um, that part of the cooling through the Cenozoic that we observe in, for example, this data, uh, this oxygen isotope, uh, curve here, part of this substantial cooling of through the Cenozoic may have been driven in part by uplift of mountains such as the Himalaya, the Alps, the Andes that didn't exist uh, 65 million years ago, right? Um, and so um, to before before I move forward, um, I just have a, a slight sort of side point here um, because I'm using a lot of terms that maybe not all of you are using or they're also sometimes used in different ways in the literature. I just want to briefly define what I mean when I say certain terms. So uh, when I talk about a flux, weathering flux, um, I, I mean a rate of mass removed per area of, of, of landscape. Um, I also may talk about erosion rate. So that would be the lowering rate of the, of the surface of the earth. Um, and then we can think of a total erosion flux. So the total mass flux from a landscape that we can estimate, for example, with meteoric, uh, sorry, not meteoric, with, with uh, in situ um, cosmogenic nuclide or with sediment fluxes. And then we can uh, think of a weathering flux. So that would be equivalent to a chemical erosion flux is what I mean when, I, when I'm using the word weathering flux. So that the, the, the portion of the erosion that is, that is chemical that is um, removed by in, in solution. So it's the total dissolved mass flux from the landscape. Um, and that can be estimated uh, for example, with uh, looking at the solutes that come out in rivers and then multiplying that with the amount or the concentration of solutes in the rivers and then multiplying that with the, with the um, runoff, with the amount of water essentially. So that, that just as an aside um, here. Okay, so to bring us back, we have this hypothesis that mountain uplift boosts weathering and cools climate, turns down the thermostat. Um, now, you, you may remember from the start of the talk, uh, there's not only silicate weathering, there's also other weathering reactions, for example, combined sulfide and carbonate weathering, the weathering of rock organic carbon oxidation that act as, uh, sorry, the, the, the oxidation of rock organic carbon that acts as a CO2 source to the atmosphere. And so over the last few decades, uh, there's been more and more evidence from active mountain regions around the globe that weathering in these places is very often dominated by rock organic carbon oxidation, sulfide and carbonate weathering. Why? Because these weather orders of magnitude faster than silicates that dissolve more, much more slowly. And so in places where you have high mountains supplying a lot of material, 
um, you're often dominated by these rapidly weathering phases. And so here's just a cross section um, of a few papers, sulfide oxidation and carbonated dissolution as a source of CO2, rock organic carbon oxidation offset silicate weathering sink, co-variation of silicate carbonate and sulfide drives CO2 release with erosion and so on and so on. So from global Taiwan, Apennines, Andes, Himalaya, New Zealand. So lots of active mountain ranges that, that um, support this, this dominance of these rapidly or, um, weathering phases that act as CO2 sources. So we have this hypothesis, but then these conflicting findings from active mountain ranges that we often are dominated by these reactions that act as CO2 sources. So does erosion actually boost CO2 drawdown or does erosion actually increase CO2 release and, and, and therefore turns up the thermostat, if you will? Um, and so to address this question here, I wanted to look at the sensitivity of these different CO2 sinks and sources to erosion in parallel across the same places to try to understand what the relative sensitivity of these, uh, of these different sinks and sources are to, uh, to erosion. And, and one of the challenges that I'm not gonna go into here in detail is to unmix erosional climate and lithologic uh, controls. Um, and, uh, and, and therefore to address this challenge, we decided to go to the few local data sets, the few data sets that we have of uh, weathering data from uh, streams that drain across uh, very large erosion rate gradients, but across a small sort of regional, small region with, with a small lithologic variability um, and also ideally a small climate variability. Uh, there's a bit of an asterisk here because the New Zealand study has a large climate gradient. Um, and so, so we, we looked at a study from Sichuan, from South Taiwan, from New Zealand, and then also a global compilation of small mountain streams um, that, yeah, I mean, violate somehow this local, uh, uh, this idea of going to local places, but it's often used as uh, in, many, in many carbon cycle models uh, or as a reference. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm throwing this in here as well, uh, because it's also looking at small rivers that are all draining uniform lithologies. And the lithologies that I'm focusing on here are meta sediments and some uh, studies in particular, the, the West study here also includes granitoid lithologies. Okay, and so before I go into the sort of whole data set, I want to briefly um, run through one of those data sets, in particular the South Taiwan study, uh, to show you what one of those data sets looks like. Um, and so let me let me briefly take you, fly you to the to the uh, island of Taiwan, which sits at the boundary between the Eurasian and the Philip the Eurasian plate and the Philippine Sea plate, and essentially um, the the uplift here is generated by the by the collision of this island arc here, the Luzon arc with the Eurasian continental margin. And the interesting thing about the setting is that the, that there, the angle between uh, the, uh, the plate boundary and the collision is oblique. And therefore you can imagine if this, when this island arc sort of um, continues moving in, um, in the direction of this arrow, the uh, zone of uplift is migrating southward. So the center of the island has been up and high for a long time. The southern tip has only just emerged from the, from the sea. And therefore, you have, we have this very nice topographic gradient from low relief in the south to higher relief in, to the north. Um, and uh, yeah, this, this major topographic gradient that's also reflected in a gradient of erosion rates. Um, and so here's a, here's a, um, a data set with different erosion rate proxies. So from cosmogenic nuclides, to uh, Thermocron um, and it plots the distance to the southern tip, so to the southern tip here. Um, so as we go north, essentially erosion rates increase um, by uh, at least a factor of 100. Um, and it's also reflected in the abundance of landslides here mapped in, in black. There is a bit of a lithologic variation across the study area. Uh, most of the study area lies in this sort of dark green unit. Um, actually, all of the study area uh, are passive margin um, meta sediments, shales, slates, phyllites that get a bit sandier toward the south. Uh, and then here the, uh, yeah, the, the units in the north um, are uh, turquoise, maybe tur more turquoise colors uh, is the right word, are <clears throat> uh, have undergone higher metamorphic, higher metamorphism, so they're higher metamorphic grade. 
the ones in dark green um, uh, are these Miocene sediments that, that have a relatively low, low metamorphic rates, shale slates, phyllites. Um, and then, so what we did is we sampled waters across the southern tip, um, and uh, we measured the, the concentrations of major cations and anions, and then we used this chemistry and some uh, idea about the end members, the silicate, carbonate, and sulfide weathering end members, to partition the the, the concentration, the solutes into these uh, into the different weathering sources. Um, we get erosion fluxes from cosmogenic nuclides, and where cosmogenic nuclides were not available, they're not available for all the rivers. We used uh, a correlation between river steepness and, and, um, and these uh, erosion rates. Uh, and then we could estimate weathering fluxes again, as I said, between time uh, by, by multiplying the concentration and the runoff. Okay, so um, here's what one of those data plots thing can look like. So now we can basically uh, plot the weathering flux against erosion flux, or if you like erosion rate better than millimeters per year, the numbers up here. Um, and, uh, and, and, and in this case, this is for the silicate portion of the, the, the solute load, of the total solute load. Um, and uh, we were thinking about the sensitivity of the weathering to erosion. So one of the pr first measurements we can make is uh, just the power law fit, essentially. Uh, note that the colors here um, note the runoff, the amount of runoff we get. Um, to just in this case show that there's a very minor runoff gradient in this case. Um, we can then also look at the other phases, so silicates, carbonates, and sulfides, and we observe that there are different, um, different sensitivities of these weathering fluxes to erosion. In particular, silicate weathering seems pretty insensitive to erosion, maybe even negatively sensitive. Um, and then carbonates and sulfides have a more positive sensitivity to, to this erosion rate gradient. And so now we're in the position to uh, add the other data uh, sets in there. So Sichuan, New Zealand, and the global data compilation. And in general, they fi we find similar patterns whereby silicate weathering is relatively insensitive to erosion across the erosion rates that we measure here. Carbonates and sulfides, or carbonates have maybe an intermediate sensitivity and sulfides have the highest sensitivity to erosion. Okay, cool. So there's one more step before we can go back to our research question, which is that I'm, I can now fit a, a weathering model to these data. And this is a commonly used weathering model that's uh, in many carbon cycle models as well. Um, and it's just here for, for, for your reference. So it's basically linking weathering fluxes uh, with uh, to erosion flux and then some climatic parameters. And here erosion features, again, this is essentially the, the uh, expression of or the control of time that the minerals have in the weathering zone uh, and how that impacts weathering rates. And essentially this model produces this, this characteristic shape where at low erosion fluxes, we're dominated by this linear term at the front. Um, and essentially if there's not enough stuff to weather, everything gets completely weathered. So there is a perfect linear relationship between what gets brought to the surface by erosion and what gets weathered. So that's where we get this linear portion. But eventually in high mountain ranges, there's so much fresh material supplied that we're not limited, not by the supply of minerals, we're limited by the either the time it takes to dissolve them, so the dissolution kinetics, or by the availability of acidic, acidic fluids, um, reactive fluids essentially to dissolve all of this. And that's when the sensitivity to erosion or to supply um, of minerals declines and plateaus. And the interesting thing is, um, if we fit these to the to the data, uh, the data didn't change, so the sensitivity didn't change. But basically, um, the 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 limits, the limitation of these weathering, or the the point where we get the transition from the supply limitation to the weathering limitation, differs between these different phases, um, as is expected from the different sensitivities here. So, in particular, the silicate weathering are look all uh, limited by the by the by the by the availability of acidic fluids or by the time it takes, whereas the um, carbonates and sulfides plot more toward the transition to the to the supply limit. Okay, so now we can go finally to our research question: What's the relative sensitivity of CO2 sinks and CO2 sources to erosion? And in this case, we have our silicate sinks. Uh, sorry, CO2 sinks in the silicates, 
and the CO2 sources in the combined carbonate and sulfide weathering. And so what we can do is now essentially infer the CO2 fluxes that we get from those weathering fluxes, right? Where are all the positive numbers here are CO2 release and all the negative numbers are CO2 drawdown. And we find the shape where, um, where essentially as we, uh, well, if there's no erosion, there's no weathering. If there's nothing fresh at the surface of the earth, there's no, no weathering. Um, but as we increase the, the supply of fresh minerals, we increase all of the weathering reactions, um, but the system is dominated by silicate weathering. And therefore we boost the CO2 or the, the increase in erosion um, leads to more and more CO2 drawdown. But as we um, eventually, the silicate weathering fluxes plateau, uh, our incense become insensitive to further erosion increases, but the, in particular, sulfide oxidation still uh, is sensitive to this erosion. And therefore we turn the system around and potentially push it to, towards CO2 release. That leads to this sort of maximum CO2 drawdown here. And the interesting thing is that for the other study areas, we also find a very similar shape um, with this sort of maximum CO2 drawdown here. Uh, even though the absolute numbers are very different, uh, probably because we're looking at different lithologies. Uh, so the absolute fluxes are different, but the, the general relationship between silicate, sulfides, and carbonates is similar. Um, and this, the location at which the CO2 drawdown is maximized is very similar in all of these study areas, around 0.07 millimeters a year. Um, and so essentially this, this 0.07 millimeters a year is typical of landscapes, not like the Himalaya, Taiwan, New Zealand, but it's typical of landscapes eroding um, sort of Mittelgebirge, right? Like these moderately eroding landscapes, such as the Oregon Coast Range, the Black Forest. Here's a compilation of erosion rates from Dave Montgomery that is broadly classified in these sort of three different groups of low relief landscapes, moderate relief landscapes, high relief landscapes. Right, so here we sit in landscapes like the Oregon Coast Range or the Black Forest. And so coming back to the question of what's the role of mountain uplift for a thermostat? Well, it looks like if we take a flat landscape and we start uplifting it and create a creating a moderate relief landscape, then um, the role of this increasing uplift would be to turn down the thermostat, cool the climate, uh, boost CO2 drawdown. However, further uplift, to landscapes such, you know, alpine style landscapes uh, could reverse that trend and um, push the system more towards CO2 release. And therefore um, we have this, this sort of binary response or continuum between the two end members of mountains being a CO2 sink or mountains being a CO2 source um, that come out of the different nonlinear erosion sensitivities that we find for these different phases. Um, and so we find that CO2 drawdown is maximized at moderate erosion rates, and therefore there's this continuum between the end member models, erosion as CO2 sources or sinks. And so what's then the role of mountain uplift for global climate? What happened? Could, could mountain uplift such as the, you know, the Himalaya Alps and so on, Andes, could it, that, that increase in erosion have caused or have contributed to Cenozoic cooling? Okay, well, if we look at average erosion rates across the Phanerozoic, they've been estimated to 0.02 millimeters per year. In the Cenozoic, they may have increased to 0.07 millimeters a year. So that would be actually taking a system that sits here to making it more efficient at CO2 drawdown, making silicate weathering overall more efficient. So if we go by these averages, then yeah, then maybe Cenozoic mountain building may have you know, boosted the, the CO2 sink and, and therefore can maybe contributed to cooling the planet. The problem is that if you look at this curve, an average doesn't get you very far. What you really need is what the distribution of erosion rates is and how that changed through the Cenozoic. And I don't know that we have these data yet, but that would be a, a cool thing to, to look at in detail. Okay, so to wrap up, I just wanna uh, hit at some of the obvious limits that we have in, in our study here. Um, and of course, We've only, I've only really talked about these two boxes right now. And as I said at the beginning, there are multiple other boxes. And in particular, there is the role of organic carbon cycling with the erosion of biospheric organic carbon and also the weathering of the rock organic, of the fossil rock organic carbon. And both components 
are probably also linked to erosion rates. And in fact, there is data out there that links, uh, I mean, here's suspended sediment yield. So think of this as erosion. Um, and then the, the yield of petrogenic organic carbon from the, from the surface of the earth, as well as the actual erosion of the biospheric organic carbon. So the, the, both those organic sinks and sources may also be sensitive to erosion. These are global data again, um, but we can do a sort of similar exercise. And actually Jordan Hemingway has done this in his, in his thesis. And he also finds this sort of shape of, uh, sort of maximum CO2 drawdown um, at, at some erosion rates. And the shape really depends on, or the location really depends on what you assume uh, about how much of the organic carbon is actually oxidized, how much is buried and so on. Um, but it seems like we may have a similar concept for the organic side, but the location of the optimum might be quite different. And so to really know what's going on, we would need to try to get those sorts of data for exactly the study areas that we have the inorganic part from, uh, or to look at the global inorganic data, but that has problems as we can discuss if you, if you, if you want. Um, but anyway, so this is a, this is a cool, I think, uh, additional thing that maybe we are looking at similar or like a, a sort of similar balance here for the organic carbon cycle. And then finally, um, there is obviously the role of degassing, and that could also change with tectonics. Linking that just simply to erosion rate is way too simple, and that can't really be done because it's also driven by, you know, uh, rifting um, and and um, and metamorphic decarbonation is is probably not directly related to the erosion at the surface. Uh, so that's a bit more complicated point to to bring into the same framework. Um, but I think we would be a, a really good step further if we could integrate the organic side into this framework. Um, so this is my just last slide here. Uh, what we haven't really touched on is the role of lithology um, and co-variation with climate. And then the other big question I would say is, is upscaling all of this from the small mountain rivers to big rivers that also include big floodplains where things can continue to weather. Um, so that's uh, future work for, for that I'm planning. And that will touch more on sedimentological concepts too. Okay, so thank you very much for listening. Hope that some of this was interesting to you and uh, happy to take questions.